This is the story of the unfair and undeserved murder of Louis Musso. Suzanne Basso, James O'Malley, Bernice Ahrens, Craig Ahrens, Hope Ahrens, Terence Singleton. These are the names of the degenerates responsible for taking the life of an innocent man. In July of 1997, 59-year-old Louis Buddy Musso, the victim in this case, first met either Suzanne Margaret Basso or her son James J.D. O'Malley at a church carnival in New Jersey. Musso, though mentally retarded, lived independently, held a job at a local grocery store, and handled his own financial affairs. In June of 1998, Musso left New Jersey to live with Basso in Jacinto City, Texas. Shortly after Musso moved, Al Becker, Musso's social security representative and friend of 20 years, began having difficulty contacting Musso. Becker had numerous telephone conversations with Basso, but Basso eventually refused to allow him to communicate directly with Musso. Concerned about Musso's welfare, Becker sought assistance from various state agencies, but was not able to gain any further information about Musso's situation. In July of 1988, Suzanne Margaret Basso unsuccessfully attempted to designate herself as Musso's representative payee of his Social Security benefits. On an application for a life insurance policy on Musso, Basso was named beneficiary and she had described herself as Musso's wife-to-be. After Musso's death, police found certificates of insurance for policies in Musso's name, including one that provided $65,000 in the event of Musso's death from violent crimes. They also discovered a document entitled Musso's Last Will and Testament, which purported to leave Musso's entire estate to Basso while no one else was to get a cent. In the days leading up to his death, Musso suffered tremendous abuse at the hands of Basso and her five co-defendants. Basso would take Musso to the apartment of co-defendants Bernice Ahrens, Craig and Hope Ahrens, Bernice's son and daughter, and Terence Singleton, Hope's fiancé, where Musso was forced to remain seated or in a kneeling position on a plastic mat in the hallway for hours on end. Whenever Musso attempted to get off of the mat, O'Malley would beat or kick him. O'Malley, Singleton, Bernice, and Craig beat Musso, and O'Malley, while wearing combat boots, kicked him repeatedly. Basso beat Musso with a baseball bat on the buttocks, back, groin, and both she and Hope struck him with a belt and buckle. After hearing that Musso had been misbehaving while she was away from the apartment, Basso, who weighed over 300 pounds, repeatedly jumped on top of him while he was on his hands and knees, causing him to fall flat to the ground. At one point, Musso requested that someone call an ambulance. Even though Hope, as she later admitted, recognized the extent of his injuries, he received no medical attention. Someone bathed Musso in a solution of bleach and pine saw cleaning fluid using a wire brush. Apparently, his killers were giving him this kind of bath when he died. On the morning of August 28, 1999, Musso's body was found dumped near a roadway in Galena Park. Because Musso's clothes lacked any blood stains and his only shoe was on the wrong foot, investigators believed that his body had been dressed after he died. The medical examiner reported an extraordinary number of injuries to Musso's body and was unable to count the hundreds of bruises that covered Musso from head to toe. The palms of Musso's hands and the soles of his feet were bruised, while his back and buttocks showed numerous lash marks indicative of his having been whipped. Musso's severely blackened eyes resulted from a hinge fracture to his skull, 
which was probably caused by a blow to the back of the head. He had sustained broken bones in his nose, ribs, and throat. Marks on his back appeared to be cigarette burns, and the medical examiner noted areas of skin abrasion possibly attributable to contact with a cleaning solution or scrub brush. The cause of death was believed to have been a skull fracture from an unknown object, which left a large X-shaped laceration on Musso's scalp. On the evening before Musso's body was discovered, Basso began what evolved into a lengthy attempt to establish that Musso had run away. She made several phone calls to people, including Becker, a niece of Musso's, and the local police, expressing concern about Musso's whereabouts. She claimed that he probably had run away with a little Mexican lady that he had met at a laundromat, and said that she was getting kind of worried about him. In a written statement to police, Basso later confessed to having driven Bernice Aaron's car with Musso's body in the trunk to the site where O'Malley, Singleton, and Craig dumped the body. She also admitted driving the car to the dumpster where the others disposed of additional incriminating evidence, including bloody clothes and rubber gloves, which the police had found as a result of O'Malley's confession. Basso was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death for her participation in the killing of Louis Musso. Her conviction and death sentence were upheld by the TCCA on direct appeal. Basso argues next in her fourth and sixth claims that her counsel was ineffective. At the punishment stage of trial for failing to investigate and present mitigating evidence. During state habeas proceedings, Basso submitted several documents which she claimed contained significant mitigating evidence that should have been discovered by counsel and presented during the punishment phase of her trial. These documents included evidence that Basso was raised in poverty, her natural father was an abusive alcoholic who abandoned his family, she was sexually molested by her stepfather, stepbrother, and uncle, she was physically abused by her mother and stepfather, she witnessed her brothers being abused in a manner similar to the abuse Musso received from Basso and her co-defendants. Basso was emotionally disturbed and performed poorly in school, and she had befriended a retarded individual when she was young. These claims were rejected by the state habeas court, based largely on the testimony of Basso's trial attorneys. Her trial counsel asserted that they had contact with Basso's family and were aware, in general terms, of the evidence Basso now presents. They also reviewed Basso's medical records and researched the complaints contained therein, interviewed court-appointed mental health experts, and employed the services of two psychologists who interviewed Basso and testified about their findings. After considering the evidence, they decided not to present it because it would support the state's portrayal of Basso as a malingerer, manipulator, and liar. Her trial counsel decided against presenting evidence of sexual abuse Basso suffered as a child because of the similarity of it to the abuse Basso and her co-defendants inflicted on Musso. The state habeas court concluded that counsel cannot be considered ineffective for not pursuing and or presenting evidence that by its very nature concerning Basso's character would strengthen the state's case against her. Suzanne Margaret Basso tried to leverage the abuse she endured as a child against the abuse she performed on another person. Suzanne Margaret Basso was sentenced to death in October of 1999. She was executed by lethal injection on February 5th, 2014.